Welcome to Politica Insight video. The issue we're going to talk about now is European defense and security, something that changes its form and format as we speak. With me to discuss that is Natalie Tocci, Director of Institute of International Affairs in Rome, but also a Special Advisor to EU's High Representative for Foreign uh, Policy and, and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini. Dr. Tocci, welcome. Thank you. Um, I think everyone would agree that there are signals that Europe is starting to think about defence and security seriously. It's going to admit that defence matters. But when we come to specifics, the, the picture is, is rather mixed in terms of spending, in terms of capability, in terms of threat assessment. Do you think the shift towards um, defence of Europe is irresistible now? I think yes it is uh, and I think the reason why it is is because unlike in any other period in our history, in our recent history, there are at least three uh, structural forces uh, at place and, and of course they're very connected to one another. The first and most obvious one is that insecurity is growing and it is perceived as growing by populations. Now, indeed, and this links to the remark that you were making about different threat perceptions, it's true that the perception of threat differs. If you're sitting in Warsaw or Tallinn, or if you're walking down the streets of Brussels or Paris or Rome, is it Russia, is it terrorism? But regardless of what that source of threat is, everyone agrees that insecurity is, is growing. So if we can you know, go back to Bob Kagan uh, that used to accuse Europe of living on Venus, it's quite clear that we don't live on Venus. So that's one, one factor. A second factor is the fact that um, there is a growing question mark over the United States' role in European security. And I don't want to connect this simply to Donald Trump. Uh, I would look at it in broader structural terms. The Cold War has been uh, over for the best part of three decades. Uh, the United States' big challenge is mainly in the East. And therefore, there is a big question mark as to whether the United States is going to look after European security, not this year or next year or the year after, in 20, 30 or 40 years' time. What and is your answer to this question? My answer is very clearly no. I don't think it's going to happen, as I said, in one, two, three, four years' time, but I think there's a structural trend. Which brings me to my third point, which is the growing realization that as Europeans, we're all very small. You know, if we're moving towards a world which is non-polar, multipolar, interpolar, however you want to put it, the truth is that there are major power centers, and to be a power, you basically need to be continental-sized. Uh, and as Europeans, none of us <laughs> fit that bill unless we act together. So I think there's this growing realization amongst Europeans that in order for us to take greater responsibility for our security, given that insecurity is rising and given the question mark over the role of the United States in future, we've got to do more, uh, more together. Now, are we going to manage to do it in the next one, two, six months, one year, two years? No. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we, you know, we cannot simply, you know, some of these capabilities will take years, decades maybe to develop. The point is, are we setting all the right mechanisms, premises, commitments to make sure that we get there in 20, 30 or 40 years time when maybe the United States will have uh, left us more on our own? And I think we are. But does Europe has to do it within the EU? framework and structure, or could it do it within NATO? Because majority of European states are in NATO, and um, of course I'm referring to these fears present in, in today's debate also, that the EU defense vision and policies are to some extent uh, competition or maybe even a threat to NATO. Yeah. I would look at it this way, Europeans need to take more responsibility for their defense and their security, Europeans then the question is, what is the right framework to do it in? And I don't think one needs to choose one or the other. Different frameworks will serve different purposes. Uh, let me take one very specific example, military mobility. Now, this is something that NATO has been very keen on. Uh, we have seen the deployment of, uh, of forces uh, here uh, in the Baltics. We know that there is a real issue of military 
uh, personnel and military uh, capabilities actually moving from one country to the other. So this is a NATO issue, but hey, the solution cannot be a NATO one because it's about legislation, because it's about the construction of infrastructure. That's where the EU comes in. And I could give you many more examples along these lines. Another one is indeed about capability development. So NATO says you need to spend more. Tick, fine, we, we get that. Europeans say you need to spend better, which means spending together. Actually, the two go hand in hand. So if you can have, for instance, the European Defence Fund that provides the financial incentives for Europeans to spend more and spend better, both the EU and NATO are happy. So we don't have to choose one, uh, one framework or the other exclusively. Since you touched this, um, the issue of military mobility or, as the Americans put it, military Schengen within, within Europe, do, do you envisage something like that being the result of the EU, NATO, prioritized cooperation? Well, at the moment, military mobility has been selected as one of the flagship uh, projects within PESCO, the Permanent Structured Cooperation. But indeed, it's very clear, and it started very, initially it started as a Dutch uh, push, uh, a military Schengen. It's very clear that the demand side was coming from, from NATO. So indeed, this is a very clear area of cooperation between, between the two. And I imagine that as the EU, qua EU, is going to increasingly act on defense, the areas of cooperation with NATO are actually going to increase. You know, the more the EU does on, on defense, the more there is scope for cooperation with NATO. So I think this is a real paradigm shift with respect to where we were in the 1990s, which then we kept on with this mantra when it was actually already detached from reality, you know, no duplication, the three Ds, etc. The truth is that in the 21st century, a, a, an effective EU on defence means a stronger NATO and vice versa. Mm -hmm. let's, talk, uh, let's talk about wider security issues. I know that you subscribe to, to the statement that security is wider than defence, but you cannot have secu security without uh, defense. But what, what is the right balance? I know there is a debate in terms of spending, for instance, in, in many European countries, how to strike the right balance between soft measures and har hard measures. What, what is your opinion? I would pick up the, uh, German, uh, the former German president, uh, his proposal on the 3% debate. I mean, to me, in an ideal situation, you have a 3% goal in which more or less it roughly divides up as 2% plus 0.7% development plus 0.3% diplomacy. That's, in my view, broadly speaking, I mean, plus or minuses on either side, a good mix of foreign policy, because ultimately it's, it's a whole that we're looking at. You know, we keep on talking about hybrid, about cyber, about counter-terrorism. None of these issues can be dealt with exclusively with one instrument. It's always going to be, by definition, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about hybrid, a mix of different hard and soft instruments. But there are some, some divisions within the European Union. For instance, for me, this, this eastern flank is, is very much maybe even obsessed with military hardware. Maybe that's because they have to catch up so, uh, so much. Whereas the western part or southern part of, uh, of the EU is, is much more in favour of these soft measures that you talk about. I mean, you know, I think inevitably, and this goes back to the different threat perceptions, you know, to the extent to which there is a more a, a traditionally harder aspect that is connected to the Russian threat or challenge, however you want to put it. Whereas if you're thinking about terrorism, which is the main concern in the South, yes, you know, you may say, well, the anti-Daesh coalition had a military uh, component to it. But the hardcore, when you're talking about counterterrorism, is not military. The hardcore is intelligence and uh, the financial sector, uh, you know, uh, you know counter-radicalization. So indeed, the, the balance tilts more towards the softer or the civilian. Um, but, but I think, you know, as I said, you know, and here I come back to the hybrid example, if we are all aware that even the Russian threat actually does not manifest itself mainly through hardcore military dimensions, everyone realizes that you need to have a mix between the two. How much does economy matter for security? I mean, can you have security 
in a world with uh, so great inequalities, in, in a world um, with exclusion and, and, and poverty. And I know we're talking still within the richest part of, of the world, but still, for many Europeans, these are the real anxieties in terms of security and perhaps not Russia. I, I, I agree with you and I think actually the two go hand in hand. Um, in, in different respects. I mean, both in the obvious numerical uh, sort of dimension to it, meaning if you have economic problems, it's far less likely that you're going to invest in defense. I mean, this was, for instance, the Italian debate. Yes. Hardly hit by the economic crisis, you're not going to start putting your money into the defense budget. There is much greater push to put it into healthcare and education and housing and you know a, a host of different measures. But there's also a second dimension to it, which is probably even more important and more interesting. And again, I go back to the hybrid example. You know, when is it that you have uh, hostile external powers that are able to do something? They're able to do something because they pinpoint those elements of fragility be it economic, be it political, be it social, within the domestic system. And that's what they leverage. That's what they use. And this is why we have, a, in Europe, a conversation about resilience. And the reason why resilience is understood as a broad concept that is socioeconomic, it's political, it, but it's also cyber and military and, and a host of other things. Um, but, but indeed, if the fragility is socioeconomic, it's far easier to then create a security problem. Do you think that this resilience, this, this robustness of uh, infrastructure, for, for instance, is addressed as, uh, at the level that it, that it actually needs to be? I think it's a journey that we're on. I think we've only just started it. Uh, this was a word that was not even used by the security community. It was traditionally used by the humanitarian and development communities, but it was never used by the foreign and security policy community. And it's only started in the last two years. And what does it mean? I think it means that we now know that there is no linear progression from bad to good. Hmm? There are lots of ups and downs even if the trajectory is a positive one. And therefore, you need to build that capacity to bounce back uh, and to adapt and to respond and to reform to shocks and changes. And th so that condition of resilience, the ability of bending without breaking, is part of that journey towards progress, basically. Mm -hmm. Speaking about bending without breaking, in any transnational institution to deal with serious matters, the number one requirement is trust and solidarity. How can you have serious discussion about security and serious action on security within Europe when there are levels of distrust and insolidarity manifested by Brexit, manifested by the rule of law procedure and what lies behind it? I agree with you, it's about trust, it's about solidarity and I'm glad you put it in these terms as opposed to different threat perception terms because I think uh, and, and then I come to the, to the question, because I think this is an, an important aspect of the conversation. We will not be able to have in Europe identical threat perceptions. Uh, it's a chimera. Uh, geography matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and some things don't change. What you can change politically is that sense of solidarity. I may not feel threatened by Russia, you are, and therefore I come and stand by you because you need it. And vice versa for issues that I am worried about and are not an issue for you. So, it's, so what I'm trying to say here is that solidarity, yes, but solidarity is a two-way two street. And it's that solidarity which is the necessary uh, sort of ingredient to do all of the things that we're doing. Now, how can we foster that solidarity? I think one of the element, it, elements uh, has to do with this appreciation of a third, the third point that I was making right at the beginning. We're all too small. Mm? Uh, the point is... I may not like you, uh, you may not like me, but the point is we need each other. Uh, and, and therefore I need to stand by you because I know that otherwise you don't stand by me when I need it. And neither of us can achieve what we want by acting on our own. Where is the United States in this European debate on security? <laughs> in many respects, far away. But paradoxically, it's precisely that perception of distance uh, or at least, as I said, that question mark over the presence and commitment of the United States to European security, which has actually added that fuel, that trigger, 
to the s s more serious security and defense cooperation that we have been having, having in Europe over the last couple of years. Okay, Dr. Tachi, thank you very much. Thank you. And stay tuned for more from Politica Insight video.